Hi, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. I was lucky enough to have a conversation with my friend, the distinguished astrophysicist, Lord Martin Rees, a few years ago on our podcast, but he more recently came out with a very interesting book about saving the world with science. And uh, I thought it was a great opportunity to have him back to talk about the subjects in the book and to have a wide ranging conversation far beyond astrophysics and its own background about uh, the areas where science uh, can impact on our lives and our future. And it was, as always, a very informative and, and lovely discussion. He's a remarkable scholar and human being and a real pleasure to talk to. And uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. The conversation was so comprehensive that we actually are dividing it into two podcasts and we're releasing the first half now. So I hope you'll enjoy this first half of the Origins podcast with Martin Rees talking about basically saving the world with science. And you can watch it ad-free on our Substack site if you're a, a Substack subscriber to Critical Mass, and I hope you'll consider doing that because th those funds support the Origins Project Foundation. If, you, if you're not a subscriber, you can uh, uh, watch it on YouTube eventually uh, if you're a subscriber to our YouTube channel, or of course listen to it on any podcast listening site. No matter how you watch it or listen to it, I really hope you'll be informed and educated uh, as much as I am every time I talk to Martin Rees. So enjoy this Origins podcast with Martin Rees. Well, uh, thank you, Martin, for once again agreeing to do the podcast. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for, for being with me today. Well, great to be in touch with you. It, it looks very cozy where you are in your study yeah. in England. Is the weather okay there, or is it uh, you haven't had any blizzards or, or, or that sort of thing there, I assume? Nothing on the scale they've had in North America, but yeah. uh, it's quite sunny today. Oh, excellent. Well, it's it's snowy today here, but not a bad day. Kind of nice, pleasant kind of snow. Um, we have had the, the I've had the privilege of already having a, 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 been with you in England for a, one of the earliest podcasts when began, that we began these podcasts. And so... I don't have to go over that territory. As you know, normally I, it's an origins podcast and I like to talk to people about their origins, but we, we talked about that, uh, your origins as a scientist um, in the last uh, time we had a podcast. But since uh, the purpose of this particular podcast, I want to I wanna focus on your new exciting book, If Science is to Save Us. We, you and I have had some discussions about it and it's a very important set of topics. So I thought it'd be nice to come back you and I talked a lot about cosmology and to some extent religion. I thought this is a this is a, a chance to talk about some of the important ideas that you're raising uh, when it comes to science and public policy. And I was thinking about it, and I, I think there have been few scientists. You can correct me, no doubt, as you often do, um, if I'm wrong. Um, th there have been few scientists in the United Kingdom that have had your level of of uh, experience and um, uh, uh, as well as uh, acknowledged experience what across a wide area of, of scientific and science and public policy I, I I don't know if there's anyone who's held as many honorific and substantive titles as you had and it, it really hit me when you talked in the middle of the book about the longitude prize you talked about I think that three of the, there are eight people that are supposed to be involved in that prize. And three of them include the Astronomer Royale, the President of the Royal Society, and the Professor of, uh, of Astronomy at Cambridge. And all three of those people were you. And, and it really hit me that, that is, I don't think there's a, any, does there any precedent for that kind of uh, experience that you hold? You really have a unique. Uh, oh, I think so. And there are huge numbers of people who are, more sophisticated in the politics and the popularization, but may not have been uh, so active academically. So uh, I think I sort of try to straddle the academic world and the popular world. Uh, but we are very lucky in Britain. Just think of this late lamented Colin Blakemore and people like that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You've no England's had its its share of mm -hmm. exceptional scientists and scientific communicators, but people who are in a position. Uh, to be able to uh, not just voice their views, but perhaps have those views have an impact through mm -hmm. their substantive roles, like like president of the Royal Society yeah. and now Lord in the in the in 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 the UK House. Of Com I think it's all the whole thing is called the House of Commons, but the House of Lords. Um, mm -hmm. 
so to have that combination of 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 interest which you have which and a lot of exceptional british scientists have had that but also the ability in principle to kind of implement that interest that seems to me almost you you may not be unique but i bet there's less than a handful of people who've had that yes. kind of opportunity well my influence is sadly limited i'm afraid but i do my best well you do your best and i appreciate that and one of the many aspects i one of the many reasons i admire you and there are many um but but I thought in the context of origins, I would at least talk about that aspect of your career path as a choice or opportunity. Um, you, you know, people take advantage of opportunities that they don't, but often it's because of their predilections at the same time. You you took on these roles from President of the Royal Society, Master of Trinity College, and then and, and the other roles that you've taken on. Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I took them on in uh, later life. Um, I, I had a very fortunate career um, starting in the uh, 1960s uh, when there were rapid changes in uh, astronomy and cosmology, first evidence of the Big Bang, black holes, etc. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate to be in a strong research group and to make many international contacts and to be able to spend much of my career at Cambridge University, which was an outstanding centre. So I was very lucky indeed, and I developed very wide international contacts, and I worked over a fairly wide spread of topics yeah. with a lot of collaborators and a lot of students, and I think I made a number of modest contributions. Oh, no come on. Don't, don't be too modest. You, you, yeah. But um, <laughs> as I say in my book, um, when I got to the age of 60, I thought I should perhaps think about whether I should do something of more direct public relevance. And also, I was motivated by noting the ways in which scientists grow old. <laughs> and there are uh, three different ways. One common way is they just um, uh, become torpid and don't do very much <laughs> um, or nothing very exciting. That's one thing that can happen. And uh, uh, there are many examples of that, and I had some in my university and in my department who were like that. I didn't want to follow their example. I wanted to do something else. Um, there are some uh, who, of course, just go on doing what they're good at and have a career sp extending into their 70s and 80s even. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's interesting that most scientists do their best work when they're young. It's um, a platitude, people say this, but there's a lot of truth in it. And the reason mm. for that is that as you get older, you become less good at adopting new ideas and learning new techniques. And therefore, uh, if you are going to go on, make a contribution in your later years, then the best you can do is to be on a plateau, doing what you're good at, etc. And uh, Incidentally, this is rather in contrast with uh, the arts, because mm -hmm. if you think of great composers, most of them did their best work in their last years. Um, and there aren't very many scientists whom you would say that. And I think the difference is that if you are uh, a composer, you're influenced by the, uh, the modes and styles when you were young, mm -hmm. but thereafter, it's just internal development. You don't need to absorb any external influences, whereas science is a more interactive and social activity. And therefore, to stay on the frontiers, I'm sure you'd agree, you've got to really be alert to what's going on and understand new things. And that's what we get uh, less good at as we get yeah, older. Absolutely. Adopting new new, new techniques. Uh, yes, yes. Which, you know, graduate students are notably adept. They're required to. I, I yes. used to have, I know a very distinguished colleague who said, well, you know, do you read everything? No, he says, but you know, I, I have graduate students who read everything, and then they can they yeah. they can educate me. What? Let me just. I know before you get to the third thing. What about the other aspect? And maybe this does isn't true because composers this way. But the other thing that I wonder about older scientists is is science does take require generally intense energy and and periods of concentration, working intensely for for a long time, years at, uh, perhaps. And yes. I'm wondering if that uh, willingness perhaps also subsides as you get older to to devote uh, such intensity t uh, to to a single problem as you get older. Um, well, I think most people's academic careers uh, tend to uh, uh, gather a lot of uh, extraneous 
duties, <laughs> administration, etc. And so n not very many uh, manage to have careers where they can be as dedicated in their later years and that. But uh, of course, it's not that one's powers of concentration decline, because think of composers, mm. think of the concentration that Wagner needed to yeah. uh, do the full score of Goethe Demerum. Yeah, 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 absolutely. In any case, I just wonder, because sometimes I think of projects and I think, boy, do I have the energy to do that project now? And yeah. earlier on, I would have had the energy, but... but uh... Well, most of us do have less energy, so we do have to conserve it, obviously. <laughs> and then the third one, which I, which I, the, the third track... <laughs> Well, the, the thir third one is uh, one which is followed by uh, some of the most outstanding scientists. Yeah, absolutely. And these are people who um, still think they're doing science. They want to understand the world, but they get bored with doing the same stuff as they did in their early career, and they overreach themselves by entering fields in which they have no expertise and um, often embarrass their admirers by doing this. And one could quote examples. Well, let me quote some. Mm -hmm. uh, um, um, two of the previous holders of my chair, actually, Arthur Eddington and Fred Hoyle, two really outstanding people with far mm -hmm. greater achievements in early career than me. But they both um, uh, became rather eccentric in their old age. Um, Eddington had his fundamental theory, a sort of numerology, where he thought he could predict the exact number of particles in the universe, etc., and uh, was really out of the mainstream in his last few years, even though, incidentally, he was uh, only 64 when he died. Wow. Uh, so he, he, he wasn't really old by yeah, most yeah. of our standards. And um, Fred Hoyle, who, again, over a 25-year period, was probably the most inventive and productive astrophysicist in the world, in my opinion. Um, lots of ideas. Um, he, in his later years, became rather isolated and... Um, uh, took up rather crazy ideas like um, uh, thinking that um, uh, pandemics came in on comets, etc., and uh, that some of the key fossils in the Natural History Museum uh, indicating the origin of birds and dinosaurs were forgeries, etc., and questioning Darwin. And thereby, although he was uh, always inventive and worth listening to, he rather diminished his reputation, although he... Uh, uh, was always lively to talk to. So that's the third way. Certainly under, underappreciated. Himself. Perhaps one of the most underappreciated great British scientists of recent time, in my opinion. But anyway, uh, Hoyle, mm. go on. I mean, you know, it's interesting, by the way, I, when when you were thinking about this, I was thinking of the contrary. I was thinking of someone, the an example of someone who at least questioned himself enough to know it was Richard Feynman. You know, Richard Feynman, you know, I wrote a book about it, but it's it's fascinating because he often talked about how as you became more famous, people would ask for your opinions on things and eventually he'd start to give them. And then he realized that he had no idea what he was talking about yeah, yeah. and giving it opinions. And and he and there was a while when he got bored. I remember there was a period he went into a to try and learn some uh, genetics and, and in, 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 a, in a molecular bio, biology laboratory. He spent a summer and I'm sure he was an interesting graduate student in that sense. Uh, yes. a Nobel Prize winning graduate student, but nevertheless, uh, and then I think he just realized that he 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 couldn't make good contribute, you know, it, the kind of contributions there that he could in physics, and he he stepped back. So yes. it's rare though that people are willing to self analyze enough to know that they're yes. Well, of course, uh, uh, some do make a switch in mid career, don't they? I could, yeah, because someone I know from the UK, yeah. um, and um. Uh, and of course, uh, let's take another example. So I think we both know it. And uh, Prima Dyson, yeah, um, did um, uh, great uh, mathematical physics in his twenties, um, and he sort of consciously said that uh, 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 y young people should uh, write papers, old people should write books. Yeah, and yeah. he wrote his first book when he was, I think. In his late fifties, in mid fifties, remember he made that transition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was, and he yeah. went on, of course. And uh, uh, I uh, uh, mentioned him in uh, uh, another memoir that I recently wrote, my my life story. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, he remained lively and interesting until his mid nineties. Well, absolutely. And I used to communicate him right. I told about two weeks before his death, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he was certainly 
still the most interesting person to talk to at the Institute for Advanced Study when I spent my time there, and he was that was when he was eighty. However, some people would say that he then began to pontificate on issues like climate change in areas where he 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 perhaps well, I mean, as I've already talked about this in other contexts, Freeman had the attitude that most people weren't as smart as him, and he didn't just and he did and, and which is which was a true statement, and it, and if he didn't trust work that other people have done i think since he right. hadn't done the climate change work he naturally distrusted it but that unfortunately it's not true as as i think my friend my late friend sydney coleman told Feynman once it's not that everyone else is an idiot just to be, that's that's a wrong assumption they're actually yeah, other right. people know what they're doing <laughs> yes and having studied something for years should give you a bit of an edge yeah exactly and and uh, i think that was a disservice he did the only disservice i know was his attitude about climate change in that sense he raised interesting questions he always was a contrarian in any case you decided to ch choose none of those paths i guess um, well what what i did was i i thought i should do something else uh of a uh, more wider nature and um i rather overdid it because within four years, um, I was a uh, uh, master of Trinity College, which is the, the biggest college in Cambridge, and I was a member of the House of Lords, and I was president of the Royal Society. And yeah, so <laughs> for a decade of my 60s, um, I was quite uh, heavily involved in uh, quite serious administration and uh, uh, public outreach, etc. Um, but fortunately, um, that was all over when I was 70, and I'm lucky to have... Uh, been able to go on for another decade um, because yeah. I'm just 80 now. Yeah. And during the recent decade, um, I've worked just as hard, but um, pacing myself, as it were, because uh, although I've done a variety of things and helped to set up new organizations yeah. and, uh, yeah. and written quite a lot, um, I'm, I've not been responsible for any major organization or committee or structure. And so uh, I feel... Uh, I don't have to be quite so uh, concerned if things go wrong because I'm the only one who will suffer. Yeah. You've learned from that. You've learned from that experience. I, I admit I, I understand it too. It's really nice not to have to run an organization. Right. No, Let me looking. ask you had, you, had you been literally insulated from that? But I mean, had you not had a tendency? Was it really only when you turned 60 that you looked, I mean, had, I'm sure you're, you're such a responsible individual. I'm sure you must have been part of committees and, and, oh, was, and of course. you were head, yeah. weren't you head of the British, what was it called? British Association of Science or something earlier on yeah, or something? Yeah. I was head of that and the Royal Atlantic Society as president. Yeah. And indeed I was a uh, uh, chairman of the European Space Agency Science Committee for a few years. This was um, before you were 60 though, right? Oh yeah. 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 yeah, yeah so you're, already, so it's not as if this suddenly, you know this response, this sense of responsibility to the scientific community or whatever, emerged spontaneously when you were sixty. You obviously felt the need to. to... Yes, but the change was that up till sixty, uh, I was involved in lots of committees and yeah. etc. But they were all in astronomy or space. Ah, okay, and then they were beyond change that. Was that uh, I felt I would uh, engage in broader topics. After okay. 60. And, and then after, and then after you stop that, you, you as you say, you 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 do things just for yourself. Although you have been involved, and we'll talk about setting up, perhaps setting up a number of interesting organizations or being involved in their 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 neonatal stages. Anyway, um, but uh, but you, I will say that I think you've gone in that other route with a little bit like uh, like Freeman's route, and you you've been more prolific in your writing. I think it's in the last ten years than before, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't need to care what people think. Yeah, that's excellent. Good. Okay, good. Well, that's a perfect, yeah. perfect segue. Well, I thought that you know it's interesting to let let me let me ask you one other question in that regard. I, I I'm spending more time than here, but I think these are important lessons for young scientists anyway, to 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 learn from and and for others. So, was the example of others and uh, when you looked up at people you admired? Did the did you uh, your decision to some sense be now? I don't want to call it a statesman of science, but something like that was were were you influenced by looking at at the people you had admired earlier who'd agreed to do that? Um, I think I was, but also I was influenced by those who I think have made the wrong decision. I mean, there was there was one person, well, said so called Ray Littleton. Mm -hmm. who was um, uh, a professor in my department mm -hmm. and he worked with Hoyle. Um, but uh, in his old age, he'd become rather sad and embittered because he had uh, espoused various theories 
which had uh, been discredited, um, but he really went on just defending them when they were instead becoming indefensible, etc. And uh, I just didn't want to end up like that. Okay, so it was more to avoid avoid the pitfalls than to rise to the peaks of the of of, of well, there was a bit of both, I suppose. Yeah. No, no, I'm just I'm wondering because when you know, I'm sure both of us have been influenced in writing by the great writers, the scientists who've been wonderful writers. Yes, I'm just yes. wondering if there were any scientists you would who who'd taken the track you've uh, of being involved in public. Well, I know of one, and we'll talk about him, Joseph Rotblatt, of course. But but uh, uh, other British scientists have played a role in influence in the government. Uh, people you knew that you, there's not that you had had no personal experience. There quite that. a few. I mean, I would say, um, uh, um, but Bob May was one yeah. okay. uh, who I knew quite well, and um, but many of the pioneers of of molecular biology. Any physicists? They, sorry. Any physicists? Um, well, of course, there was the earlier generation uh -huh. uh, who were in, uh, involved in the war, and of course, that 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 generation, um, uh, of course, got huge responsibility young, yeah. and they continued. Uh, people like Cockcroft and uh, um, Penny and people yeah. like that who were involved in making the bomb, uh, and uh, those who were involved in radar, and um, people like. Um, uh, Lovell and Ryle, the pioneers of radio astronomy, uh -huh. uh, they, they did radar during the war. And um, Lovell, who built this uh, huge telescope in um, Dottrell Dutt Bank in Manchester yeah. in the 1950s, uh, he, he was fairly young, uh, but he was very enterprising and ambitious because he'd done uh, a lot when he was in his 20s uh, so, during the war. Trial by and, fire. Uh, uh, and he was, a, in my opinion, a really great man because he built this um, big dish and it's been upgraded and it's 65 years old now and it's still doing uh, work uh, which he couldn't have conceived of. Um, it's it done some of the best work on um, uh, looking for um, the uh, evidence for gravitation away from binary pulsars yeah. and all that's been resurfaced. But at the same time as uh, uh, doing work on projects he couldn't have conceived of 65 years ago when he built it. It's also become part of uh, um, British heritage. It's a designated World Heritage Site, uh, rather like Stonehenge. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm showing Stonehenge and uh, Jodrell Bank. I wonder whether 5,000 years from now, whether people will unearth it and wonder what its purpose was like. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope not in a way that will apply something about the end of our civilization, but maybe. And we'll get there. Speaking of the end of our civilization, the title of the book is If Science is to Save Us. That, in some sense, presumes the, that we need saving. Do we and why? Well, I think um, as... I discuss in the first half of the book, mm -hmm. uh, we are under threats of various kinds, which are at least indirect consequences of the advance of science. Um, we are um, subject to um, uh, uh, climate change and uh, environmental despoilation, etc., because of a larger and more demanding population using more energy, etc., mm -hmm. and that population would never have got so large had it not been for the benign effect of uh, biomedicine, uh, allowing people to live for longer, etc. Uh, so uh, the um, stakes are getting higher because science provides great benefits, but also along with those, there are very severe downsides. And so that's really the theme. Of course, the first um, example of this was the uh, um, the nuclear bombs mm -hmm. in the 1950s, uh, depending on technology of the 20th century. But the 21st century sciences of bio and cyber, they are going to have a similar effect, uh, which uh, needs great prudence in order to apply safely and ethically. And so that's that's really that's what I meant. And so there are these contexts in which science could destroy us in ways which are the downside of its benefits. So the aim has to be to harness the benefits and minimize the risk of the downsides, which are getting very serious. And so the first half of the book outlines 
yeah. these topics. And the second part of the book uh, discusses more of the scientific community, its ethical responsibilities, education, and uh, understanding science by the public. Yeah, in fact, it, that's a wonderful summary. I was going to go into that. I think you sort of summarize it nicely at the beginning. You say, my focus will be on instead on um, uh, on how the so- how the sciences impinge on our lives and on the hopes and fears for the future. I shall offer thoughts on what distinguishes science from other intellectual activities, how the entire scientific enterprise is organized nationally and globally, and how to ensure that scientists and their innovations mesh into society so that applications are channeled in accordance with citizens' preferences and ethical judgments. And 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 in, you write, say right after that, I think the important point that you've just made, but you say it beautifully, I thought, the stakes had never been higher. The earth has existed for 45 million centuries. I love that. I'm going to use that again. The earth has existed for 45 million centuries, but this is the first century in which one dominant species can determine for good or ill the future of the entire biosphere. And so, yeah, the book is 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 organized, and I want to go into that, and I want to discuss each of those things. But I think I want to jump in, in a way, to one of the you know, I tend to be a little contrary to one of the um, examples that, you know, you use the pandemic at, at the very beginning. In fact, one of the first sentences is, in, in fact, the first sentence of your book is, in our response to COVID-19, we are told to, quote, follow the science. Um, and there was never such a time, as you say, where, when, 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 uh, when experts uh, achieve such prominence um, yeah, in fact, the next sense, there's never been a time when experts have had such public prominence. Well, that's true, but I, the, I guess the question I have is when, in retrospect, has that helped? Um, it, it, it's now become almost a taunt that politicians use when they say follow the science, because they keep pointing to other people say, oh, you know, when they, when they criticize masks, they say, look, they follow the science. They claim to follow science, but they weren't. They were just part of a, a herd of sheep. And, and then when when the public learns that you know uh, that something that was claimed to not work might work, or something that was claimed to work didn't work, the question I have is: in the end, by achieving such prominence, did it ultimately produce a, a distrust of science among politicians and the public that some of them didn't have before? Because for the precise reason that this was the first time the public saw how science really works, which is. You know, tentatively with que- and and at the forefront, there are always things wrong, but it's self-correcting, and and all of that is kind of a little too subtle for the headlines, and the net result is sometimes negative. So I wanted to ask you about that. Well, it does um, prompt negative tabloid headlines. There's no doubt about that. But I think it was an example where, as you say, the public did get a feel and impression of how science is actually done. And things were uncertain. They'd no idea uh, what the virus was like and what the prospects were of dealing with it and um, didn't know how it was spread. Was how to protect problem? yourself, whether masks really work. Well, whether masks were good thing or not, or whether we should wipe surfaces and all, all that. All those things were quite uncertain, and they, they gradually firmed up. And certainly in um, England, uh, the top scientists appeared regularly on television along with the prime minister, etc. And I think they were respected because they, um, uh, they they did emphasize the uncertainties. But of course, most important of all, um, vaccines were developed within a year. Just, which is um, which is unprecedented, which unfortunately in some sense gives the public... A- <laughs> for HIV after 40 years. It was remarkable that uh, uh, the program to uh, actually um, uh, design and manufacture in a mass scale appropriate vaccines was achieved within a year. So I think this indicated that science can do something for us. Yeah, no, in fact, in some sense, though, I also worry about that. I think I've, I've written about, read about this, I've written about it in my oh, way back in the physics of Star Trek books that said the biggest sort of scientific fallacy that Star Trek produced was the notion that you'd have this huge problem and within two hours you could solve it. And, and, and it, that's just not the way science normally works. It, it right. only takes decades to solve difficult problems mm-hmm. and, and gives people, and I think that kind of TV science fiction mentality has given people both a, a faith in science and technology's ability to solve problems, but false expectations about how quickly or well those problems can be solved. And so 
Um, yep. You know, expecting scientists to produce a vaccine right away and expecting them to know whether masks worked or not or, or whether some particular dr antiviral drug worked or not. And then being disappointed when they found out that they not only, well, first of all, that we didn't know. And secondly, that the opinions varied over time. And and uh, maybe in England, I, I, sus I don't know. You see, in the United States, it's definitely produced a backlash. The governor of Florida... Who was an educated person? He went to, I mean, presumably educated. He he went and did a degree at Yale and then a law degree at Harvard. So therefore, in principle, has had some exposure to thinking. Um, said, you know, all the experts told us that that vaccines would protect us against against uh, COVID. We, we, we wouldn't get COVID when we took the vaccines. But look, they're wrong. We people get COVID have taken the vaccines. A complete misunderstanding of the of the fact that increasing your level of protection is not the same as as mm -hmm. as being you know 100 percent immunity and that and they use that as of course a political tool and the public then you know and people like mr fauci you talk about are, is as much a source of derision in the u.s as as mm -hmm. as pride yes. i suppose yes well i mean i think uh uh, it is the case that although america has made it the world's best science mm -hmm. it has the largest segment of uh, anti-science um and uh, denial uh, people among its population. So I think uh, scientists have a harder time in the US than uh, in Europe. Um, I think it's only recently that more than 50% of the American public have accepted Darwinism. Uh, so it is way behind Europe and uh, there's a stronger anti-science or science. Yeah, yeah, it's, I guess it's true, I wonder. But, 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 um, but, but to go back to it, I mean, I don't believe everyone can, even in America, can believe that we can have an instant answer because everyone knows that um, uh, Nixon tried to uh, um, get a cure for cancer in the 1970s by throwing money at it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't realize it wasn't quite like the Apollo program where the principles were known that by throwing money at it, you could achieve a marvelous success. Yeah. It wasn't like that because people didn't know where to start or how to spend the money. Um, and I think everyone is interested in cancer and they must realize that uh, progress has been made, but it's a very long haul indeed. Yeah, well, I, I would like, uh, yeah, I, I it, it, that's a great example. Use it in the book. And uh, it's just, I'm not sure how much that has sunk in. And, and But you're absolutely right in terms of the challenge. And, I, and as a personal thing, I think I talked to you at the time when I was considering moving to England to take a position at Oxford in the public understanding of science. And, and, and one of the reasons I... There, that I didn't do end up doing that is that I felt that if you're interested in the public understanding of science, like me and also an American as well as, well as a Canadian, that I should spend uh, my proposal at the time was to spend half the time in the U S because I felt if you talked about public understanding of science and you ignored the U S you were doing a disservice in the end that I didn't, I didn't. Great to need that. Yes. Um, but, um, but let me just point out, I was just reading in the news this morning that there are now, uh, uh, not epidemics, but close to that in certain parts of the United States regarding measles and uh, and chickenpox in Ohio and other places, because of this notion, this question, the whole question of vaccination as personal freedom versus public responsibility, has really now in the U.S. at least, and I, I see it the same in Canada. I, I I don't know if it's the same in England, has become an issue where people feel that they it used to be uh, that people, children were forced to have certain vaccinations before they could enter public school for, mm. as a public safety measure yep, yep. Uh, against childhood disease like measles and chickenpox and things like that. Um, and now there are incre apparently uh, huge numbers of people who are refusing to do that. They say, look, we have the freedom to not vaccinate our children. And, uh, and, and in some sense, the whole public discussion over vaccination associated with COVID has led to that. I'm wondering, so I'm wondering if that's a step backwards as a result of, of the successful creation of vaccine. I'm raising these questions just yeah. because I don't know the answer, actually. Well, I suppose the public is more aware of the issues now, um, but I think they um, balance the risks incorrectly in those contexts. I think we'd agree with that. Oh, yeah, of course. And, and of course, incidentally, one of the, the, the main problems in conveying scientific issues to the public when they have a practical implication is to ensure that probabilities are properly understood because it's very easy to uh, 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 misunderstand this and uh, realize that often if you do a test, false positives can outnumber the real 
uh, cases, but nonetheless, the test is a good thing to do. So it's not completely straightforward, but this is just one of the issues where one does ha have to uh, try and educate people. And this leads to a separate question, which is science education of young people. Yeah, which uh, we'll get to I, eventually. Thought, we, yes. Yeah, no, I mean, incredibly interesting thing. And importantly, an important issue, which uh, you're aware of, I think I just recorded a podcast that'll appear sometime with your Oxford colleague, Tim Palmer, about about uh, the importance of uncertainty and and probabilities and 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 it was a, a fun and detailed part, uh, discussion I think. Um, by the way, do do you agree? Uh, let me just ask you as a question of public policy. And you've made the point, and I've tried to make it too. When it comes to public policy, scientists are just citizens. They're not. They, they don't. We don't have any special. Uh, you know, we can, we 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 need. We have expertise that's relevant for the determining of public policy, but all the factors, as you go into in great detail, that affect public policy are affected by issues well beyond science, and therefore we can, you know, we don't, we shouldn't necessarily be taken, our views in that regard are not necessarily special. But having said that, should, do you think ch children should be, a, a requirement to enter public schools should be that children are vaccinated against childhood diseases that could, that will thereby protect their, their, their peers? Um. Well, in, in principle, it may be or may not be, because, as you say, there is a trade-off between freedom um, and the safety of others. And uh, I think um, that is just the kind of decision which uh, politicians and the public have to make. But in making it, they've got to be aware of the genuine scientific uh, uh, evidence, or at least the best estimates we have of what the risks are. And... They've got to accept that the scientists are genuine experts. I mean, if they if they get ill, yeah. uh, they can dis discriminate between a kind of uh, medic who can help them and someone who is just a quack. Uh, and in the same way, uh, one would hope they can distinguish the um, views of someone who is a genuine expert from someone who has no credentials. Yeah, you know, was, <laughs> yes, and my 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 editor, one of my editors, once said that you know when when the aliens come, everyone will turn to the scientists. People, there is an inherent faith in the scientists, but but you did. It's clear you've had a public role for a long time because you managed to you, you you turned my question around into and gave a very relevant answer, but didn't give your own opinion, which was what, just wondering whether I I I think just I'm of the opinion, for example, that people. I think it comes from having grown up in Canada that people should be required to wear helmets when they drive motorcycles, not because I care whether they kill themselves, but because they're ultimately their impact. It's a social responsibility in some sense, because, and so, so we have, we are born free, but we do live forever in chains. And, um, and, uh, and so yeah, I think we have a social responsibility to some extent to ensure that the children we send to school basically are not threats to other children in some ways. Yes, no, no, we do. But of course, to contrast those, I mean, uh, no one claims any downside wearing a helmet. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, no. Oh, in there's Arizona. There's a zero downside of vaccination. Oh, no, you problem. haven't lived in the United States. And I lived in Arizona and uh, and where you don't have to wear a helmet. And and, and, and there, everyone, everyone claims there's a downside to wearing a helmet. It reduces the pleasure of riding a motorcycle, the breeze in your face and all of these <laughs> things. Anyway, all of these things, as you point out, are... are there may be uh, one of the great senses we'll get to is something like understanding, you know, risk is different than 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 deciding how to how to address it or something like that. Because in some sense that is personal, but it's also societal, and it's up to politicians and the public ultimately to weigh those risks. And the goal, the role of science, which I think you stress over and over again, as I do, is to provide the information to allow you to at least make a more intelligent assessment of the risks. Yes. And, and, but it does, but I did ask, but I did leave a question to myself and I want to move on, but, you know, to this whole COVID experience, it, it's caused me to think about this issue of, can there be informed public debate about scientific results when the very nature of science is not understood? Can we have an informed public debate before people know about probabilities and, and, and self-corrections and, and the fact that, you know, there, there's never, we don't necessarily know everything a hundred percent. So can we have that kind of public debate? Well, I think we can. I mean, it may be that some people uh, uh, will be easily bamboozled. Um, yeah. But uh, I think uh, even though um, there are some people who we call experts and uh, some people who are completely sort of lay, as it were, uh, I think uh, one could uh, expect that among opinion leaders and politicians, uh, there are some who 
are um, uh, fully attuned to what the risks are. They understand the argument. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why in uh, all these issues, um, it's important to have uh, politicians who can explain the issues clearly. And it's important also that uh, scientists should have their voices amplified by uh, charismatic individuals who have wider traction with the public than the scientists do themselves. I mean, I discuss this in the context yeah. of climate change. Yeah, well, uh, but it's, I guess the danger is that the politicians are charismatic in individuals as well by virtue of the fact that they've been elected. You you did have a prime minister recently who was well-educated, but, but, but nevertheless seemed to often promote um nonsense that's right <laughs> <laughs> um and did it very charismatically i would argue uh, but his um, education was in the classics oh there we go okay well that'll that'll produce a lot of letters now martin that you'll have to answer <laughs> uh, not me i hope um but um let's go now to the the substance more to, in detail the substance of the book as you point out the first part of the book is really to talk about threats and then you talk about the organization of science and it's and the scientists themselves and ultimately education so i want to divide things in those areas and spend a fair amount of time on the threats but i don't want it to be a boom and gloom discussion because you know the latter part of your book is really really important about how science is organized but um let's talk about them as far as i can see there's where well, you mentioned three really the three greatest, the three big sort of technical threats that that in some sense science can save us from, and in some sense science is relevant for, um, are climate change, sort of pandemics and biomedicine and terror, as one item. So climate change, sort of biomedicine, and then artificial intelligence as the three, the three sort of chief things that you discuss in the book. In any case, um, uh, you know, climate change. Um, let, let me let in, the, in those regards. You make a statement that I also want to parse because um, uh, because it raises questions in my own mind, um, which is really great. That's one of the wonderful things about your book and and our discussions, as you often cause me to think, rethink things. But you say make the statement. It sounds good on the on the surface, but I wonder whether anyway. Scientists have an obligation to promote beneficial applications of their work in meeting these global challenges. Well, who could argue with that? Except, except for the questions, we'd often, why, how is it clear that we know what's beneficial? What are beneficial applications of our work? Especially if those applications may be 50 years down the road and we have no ideas of, at the beginning. But also, what if we think applications are beneficial, but we, until they're tested, we really don't know whether they are. For example, you raised this question let me give an example later on. And, um, you know, malaria, you know, uh, genetic engineering that basically en engineers mosquitoes, malaria producing mosquitoes out of existence and mm -hmm. makes them extinct. Something that seems to me, since I hate mosquitoes, seems like a lovely thing to, yeah. to do. But you do raise it under a different context. You say, well, should we be doing that? But on the, on the face of it, ending malaria for poor children and pe people in, in, in what you would call the global south. I'm trying to not use the word developing countries anymore because I've I read, I read that you use global south and maybe we'll talk about that. But mm. I mean, I, on the surface, it seems incredibly beneficial or, you know, I mean, you know, and, and just like science, people who thought for putting cane toads into Australia might be incredibly <laughs> beneficial. And so there's this question of how can we, do we really have an obligation to promote beneficial applications? But, in advance of knowing what's beneficial, and sometimes when we think what's beneficial is in fact not beneficial. Yes. Well, that's always good. It's um, it's a trade-off, isn't it? And one does have to to decide um, uh, is the, the risk small enough um, to um, go ahead nonetheless because there's an obvious benefit. Um, I think this is true in in all the cases. It's it's true of vaccines. Um, but it's certainly true in these cases. I think in, in the case of the mosquito, I, I would uh, uh, agree we should go ahead with gene drive. Um, but on the other hand, uh, one is aware that uh, a runaway change to the ecology uh, could have a downside which outweighs the benefit. Uh, so one needs to be open-minded and one needs to consider as many scenarios as possible and present the options to the politicians. To, okay, to present the options. What about ge what about solar geoengineering, um, which again seems potentially beneficial, but as you point out, um, 
we don't really know the effects of 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 blocking visible sunlight as a way of no. of, of of reducing the infrared uh, um, well that's more of serious but that's more serious because uh, the effects would then be global and, yeah uh, absolutely although uh, it's more serious in that sense although I, I must admit less serious in another sense if you make a genetic change to population as you point out I mean even human population yes. it can exist for not eternity, but for a heck of a long time. Where solar geoengineering aerosols you put in the atmosphere will be gone within a year. So, it's you know they're global impacts, but they're but they're shorter term. Yes, yes. Um, well, I mean, uh, on geoengineering, in the sense of um, uh, uh, putting stuff in the upper atmosphere, yeah. uh, uh, I think, as you say, it would be very dangerous to start doing this on a big scale. Yeah. Till we had much more detailed and more reliable climate models about what it would actually do, how yeah. would it change cloud cover, etc. And we're far from having that. Um, so I, I don't think we're anywhere near being in a position where it should be done. And of course, incidentally, the the worry then is that it could be done by one nation. Right. So it's the worry and the benefit in a sense, because to solve to really solve climate change, we have to have a global consensus. And I yes. think you, I think you come through in the book as I am, as somewhat pessimistic about whether we'll ever get that global yes. consensus. So that's yes. a, the positive of geoengineering is you don't need a global consensus, but it's also the negative because one well, country could do it. it indeed, that's that's true. That's the, that's the worry, and and that's why I think we should uh, um, try and uh, avoid any implementation. But nonetheless, um, I do think it's worthwhile to explore the technology of uh, how you can uh, change the albedo of clouds and how sure. efficiently you can launch these particles and how how long they do stay in the upper atmosphere, etc. And I think it's a pity that uh, there are some people who object even to that. I know that uh, in Cambridge, in my Cambridge, um, there was a very modest experiment being proposed and there was some uh, Canadian um, uh, campaign group that uh, persuaded uh, uh, the funders to take the money away from that, even though all we're trying to do is to see what would happen if you had a, a balloon one mile high. Yeah, yeah. No, that's, so it, I think one one ought to do the research. But of course, um, the, the word geoengineering is used in two different contexts, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, what we've been talking about just now is um, uh, modifying the upper atmosphere, like an artificial volcano, as it were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's something which is dangerous. Um, the kind which is in principle benign is sucking CO two out of the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. benign. It's it's it may be never very economic. It's not practical, but it's no. very hard to incentivize. But but if that could be done in a in a cheap and effective way, uh, then I think that could achieve a global consensus that was worth doing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, hard be hard to imagine a global consensus argument wasn't worth doing. And the okay. economics, it, you know, at this point, the economics just and the logistics seem incredibly impractical. I visited, we visited uh, a remarkable facility in Iceland that's doing this, uh, run by an astronomers, actually, who I met, I met when I was going to give an astron a lecture, public lecture on astronomy there, but they were actually had moved to become involved in this, in this incredible facility near the thermal facility of capturing carbon and putting in rocks but of course it's it's very in it's great but ineffective in the global sense but but well, it has to be on a huge scale you know, um, yeah. and uh, uh, the other problem is that um uh, unlike um uh, adaptation where a, a country benefits from the money it spends uh in the case of um this, this kind of mitigation mm -hmm. uh, you, your your country doesn't benefit from having these things on your land. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the whole world does, but yeah, but that's not yeah, the same thing. Yeah, that's why it's going to be very very hard to incentivize. It, yeah, unless yeah, unless well, I suppose there'd be money to be made by selling these things, and companies, private companies, might 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 therefore get benefit. And the well, but they might work. Well, why are they going to use them? We don't. Well, they'll sell them to other countries. I don't know. Yeah, but anyway, yeah. No, it's true. It's a it's a. It's very hard to to incentivize the but expenditure. Let, but let's you know I guess I want yeah th let's go into this a little more detail also because I can't resist is that so solar geoengineering the normal kind of geoengineering that we talk, we'll talk about it putting aerosols and artificial yeah. volcanoes you I it makes perfect sense to say we really need more research before we should do it I think that's 
that's a very uh, unbelievably you know you can't argue with that in my opinion however it's risks and rewards and at some point some people have argued that um that even you know because even if even if the world comes together to reduce its carbon footprint on a time scale even appro remotely approaching what the government's claimed to try and do by 2050 yeah. that there'll be an overshoot and that overshoot will be dangerous so what would uh, would one i guess the point to demonstrate that this is the science the social issues are are sometimes as important as the scientific ones yes research is needed now more but if in 10 or 20 years there's much more the impacts of climate change are much more severe but the research has not yet been done we would probably have to reassess whether we should just go ahead without knowing exactly what's going to happen because the rewards might be more beneficial than the risks do would you agree uh, yes i do because i think the uh, bigger the temperature rise is the more worrying it is because um even if we consider the uh, benign kind of geoengineering sucking the co2 out mm -hmm. then if the change has got beyond a certain threshold it's by no means obvious that it will reverse and come down yeah if you cross the tipping point yeah. then it could be that once the temperature rise has got above say two degrees then even if you suck out the carbon dioxide down to the present level um the atmosphere may find a different equilibrium at four degrees something like that so well that's a reason for trying to uh, minimize the change to avoid that sort of uh, irreversibility coming in also, I forget where in the book because it, it, uh, I made a note because it, it resonated with me that you can't know everything before you do anything. And at some point, well, it's you know, and that's a that's something I try and instill in my graduate students. I used to because uh, I remember when I was a graduate student, I wanted to know everything before I started a problem. Uh, you know, and then I realized you eventually have to do something. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, but it's true globally. At some point, political decisions are always going to be made based on incomplete knowledge. Yes. And we have to accept that fact that that we don't know that we can recommend that this may be useful, but we don't know for sure. And at some point, someone has to make a decision and politicians almost will never be able to make it. it, it, it politics would be too easy if, if you could always make decisions where you knew the what the results would be. And, yes. and but, but I think in the context of climate, there are courses of action which are unambiguously positive yeah uh, and, okay. and that, that that is to move towards carbon free energy generation yeah. and storage and all that goes with it um but but then another point i emphasize in my book is that it's not enough for the global north to achieve a net zero by 2050 which i think is feasible uh -huh. the point is that um the global south by 2050 will have four billion people and they are now um, using less energy per capita than we are by a big factor. And they're going to need more energy per capita if they okay. are to develop in the way we hope they will. And we've got to make sure that they can leapfrog directly from smoky stoves uh, to clean energy, just as they've leapfrogged directly to uh, smartphones mm -hmm. and never had landlines. And so the reason why we want to accelerate R&D into all kinds of clean energy. Mm. It's not only for nations like yours and mine uh, to uh, aim for net zero by 2050, but to ensure that um, uh, it is going to be possible for the global south to do the same thing. Because if we in the global north do this, then those in the global south may well be producing at least half as much CO2 as the world is now today. And, and that will not be enough to stop the continuing rise. So the crucial thing is to ensure that um, the global south has the resources and the technology to do the same as the northern countries can and uh, develop, but using carbon free energy. Okay. I agree. Uh, let me let me parse again to ask it, parse that a little more carefully. First of all, just to make it clear, because I think global south is not a word that it's a word that's learned. That is the word that's being used now to, to what we would have called developing or third world countries and now called global south. Is that that's a, the, more or less right? Um, uh, uh, 
Southeast Asia and yeah. South Africa, Africa. Uh, which owns any way the population is rising fastest. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but now having said that, yes, absolutely, we have that obligation, but that obligation is probably not going to be met. And then some people would argue, it's nice, I mean, the, the reason we have smartphones and we don't have simple ways to leapfrog in climate is that it's easier to make a smartphone. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and, and so the question is, can we expect the, the global south to really do that? And if we can't, do we have any right to say, no, you can't produce hydroelectric dams or burn coal or whatever, that you can't work as to, because it's too late, because we already screwed things up, you, you don't have a right anymore to take the old fashioned technologies and try and improve your quality of life or your or standard of living in your country? Well, I think that's too pessimistic because uh, we know that there are technologies that uh, can uh, provide net zero for, for us. Yeah, well, I, look, I've had this argument with, with maybe, a guy maybe named Michael. Maybe but certainly uh, uh, sun and wind plus lots and lots of storage plus uh, long distance smart grids, etc. Well, and that's a technology which is feasible. And there's only economic limits on that being deployed globally. And yeah, so may we, maybe. We, Although, I, again, I had this debate with a guy named Michael Schellenberger who have, uh, who who has said, and I think it's probably reasonable to say, it's not just energy production, it's en energy intensive, uh, intensiveness. And the land area and the, the energy intensiveness you get from a hydroelectric dam or a nuclear plant, for example, taking much, you know, can produce much more power in a much smaller area than, than having a distributed wind farm or solar farms. So we can't, if we want to bring those people up quickly, you need energy intensiveness as well as overall energy you know, production, and, and therefore that's, we have that's, to... That's not clear. It's not clear. It's more expensive to get right. energy from uh, in Africa from uh, uh, solar energy than from nuclear. Um, oh, the question is one of land use and land area. That's all I was thinking about. I mean, you can, you, uh, uh, you know, I'm quite sympathetic to what you just said, and I agree. We need to but try and look at ways to like leapfrog. I just don't, not clear to me, it's not clear to me we have that technology yet. To allow them to leapfrog at a level that would bring their populations up to be able to even adapt to climate change, to have the fresh water and and energy mm. access. Um, well, they need resources, and that means they need economic development, and we've got mm. to collaborate with them. Yeah, but it's usually in our interests. Of course, it's usually in our interests, but but, but um, and so um, even if it has to be heavily subsidized by the north as a yeah. mega Marshall plan, as it were, uh, yeah. then we should still do it. Because oh. other, otherwise, there's going to be um, disasters in, in, for all of us. Um, and also, incidentally, um, uh, ma massive migration on a scale we can't cope with. The, exactly. I was going uh, to bring up migration. Um, uh, all of these things make ultimate sense, but doesn't mean that people... It's in our own interest to be benevolent. In a, it's not altruism. But yeah, yeah. I see no evidence that that's... That, that that level of understanding that it's in our interest is causing the 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 the, the global north as you call it to take the necessary actions i mean migration is a clear example it's obvious given that the what's just happened you know with the sudan or or you pick a, your favorite recent country syria the impact of 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 small relatively small number of migrants namely only a few million instead of a few hundred million it's yeah. caused a social uh, discord and 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 instabilities on the left you have it on the level of 100 million then it's a national security issue yet countries don't seem to care well i mean you can accommodate that in canada certainly and that's really the prime destination because <laughs> you're least affected by global warming so that, that's the case but um but but i, I think i think you're, you're right uh but uh, there are examples. I mean, the, the Marshall Plan after World War II mm -hmm. was an example of, uh, um, well, enlightened altruism, let's say. Yeah, enlightened like, no. Do you have any... Uh, this again comes down when, when we were... I was going to talk about Sputnik moments, but let, let's leave that to later. But do you have any... Uh, the After the... You know, was uh, after the destruction and devastation of a world war, the need to... The need to bring the world back is clear. Do you have any suggestions for how, what might, or any ideas about what might motivate or prompt or uh, get the kind of political will to produce a global Marshall Plan? 
I know that it's it's you know it's a very difficult question, but well, I think to to, uh, uh, to make politicians care about uh, what may happen thirty or more years ahead. I mean, the main yeah. problem is short termism yeah, by yeah. politicians thinking about the next election, and the only way in which uh, they will care more about what happens thirty years ahead is if voters clamor for this. And uh, that's why I say in my book, um, uh, we should welcome the demonstrations by young people mm -hmm. who will be alive at the end of a century. And we should welcome the uh, uh, um, influence of charismatic figures who have an appeal to large numbers. And I mentioned in my book, four very different yeah. people, um, yeah. Pope Francis, who has a billion followers in uh, uh, Latin America, Africa and East Asia, and uh, his uh, encyclical, got us in the standing ovation at the UN and was a very important development. So he's one. Um, David Attenborough, our secular Pope, yeah. uh, influenced people to take this seriously. Bill Gates, I think, is a mm. widely respected figure who's talked a great deal of sense about what the technology will allow us to do. And mm. Greater Thornburg as a symbol of the younger generation. And uh, we want more people like that who will influence the public. And uh, if the public cares about what happens in the lifetime of their children and grandchildren, uh, then uh, they will vote for politicians who respond to that. Or, so or it, it isn't even have to change. But it it's not crazy to expect that change. Yeah, no, but it's also I, I want to reinforce that another way. I don't think the vote is necessarily the case. I think it's more, even more, even dictatorships. It, it, there's there's well established social science that suggests when three percent of the population in a, in a become actively engaged in an issue, then mm -hmm. then it causes a societal change. And oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. and that's but I, I it's true whether you have a democracy or dictatorship. Dictatorships have more control, and the and the virtue of a dictatorship, especially an enlightened one, is the ability to think longer term. You know, think, yes. Sing think Singapore, where they're already planning what roads they have need twenty years. And, but yes. but at the same time. Uh, dictatorships can't function if the, if, a, if 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 the public ultimately, at a f and you know Iran is in the process of maybe observing that. If mm -hmm. once a significant enough fraction of the public say no, we yeah. this is a line we won't cross. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether there's democracy or dictatorship. No, so what what I'm saying is that the public opinion you, you matter long term, and people have to care about their children and grandchildren. Yeah. Yeah. If that happens, uh, then. Uh, I think there could be the political will, whatever yeah. the form of government is, to uh, do these things and ensure that um, net zero can be achieved by the world and not just the prosperous world. I guess what I was the question I was asking, and I've often I've had this discussion for forty years with colleagues. Uh, the first paper I think I even got involved in this when it was nineteen seventies was that. Um, do you think there'll be? You think it's likely to come from a few charismatic individuals or a? I global impact i mean you know is there is it likely that that something will happen in a something in the physical world will happen that will cause people enough to be enough afraid enough you know one would have thought it maybe when new york you know flooded with the subways or 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 mm -hmm. it, it, is it likely there'll be a natural phenomenon that you think that would cause people to be able to finally say enough is enough or not not I think that might happen. I think we've seen this in a in a slightly more modest way uh, with um, uh, pollution of the oceans. Mm -hmm. This wasn't at all on the agenda, but I think this is where uh, uh, David Attenborough's programs. Yeah, um, I think they're even seen in the U.S., but they're certainly seen very widely in the world, and uh, they have made people aware of the uh, effect on marine life and all the rest of it of plastic pollutions, and that is certainly in. In, in England uh, led to some legislation which wouldn't have happened had the politicians not realized that the public was mindful of this issue. Excellent. And so that, okay. that's an example. But, but I think uh, if the public is known to care, um, then these issues will be prioritized. And uh, this may need um, more elaborate R&D in order to bring down the costs of clean energy or or something fundamentally new, or perhaps um, uh, a, a system of smart grids on the transcontinental scale. That's another yeah. possibility. Yeah, you talk about the need to. That will be a need, certainly when it comes to the global south. Will be need. 
energy production may happen in one place, but be able to transport it to places that need it is no, a no. is a, a non-existent ability right now, but something that would would be a game changer in terms of global uh, cooperation and, and the global need yeah. to address carbon. And the global south can make money sending, mm -hmm. sending the uh, energy to places like Canada and Britain. Yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And 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 that, but in, even when it doesn't involve making money, it involves self interest, as you say. If you can, mm -hmm. if you can uh, send that energy, um, and uh, yeah, but I think this desire, of course, and we'll get to it. To, it's the last part of your book is to is to scientists interacting with the government, with the public. I mean. And yep. it's one of the reasons both you and I do some of the things that you and I do, including what we're doing right at this instant. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let me let me let me pick up another statement um, early on, and we will get through this at some point. I have we're we're on page two of twelve pages, so so you know. But we we'll get but there's there's so much I want to talk to you about. But I do want to ask this question. You say when it comes to things like AI, you say we will need the insights of social scientists to help us envisage envisage how human society can flourish in a networked and AI dominated world. We've been talking about climate change, but this statement was made early on in your book. And I do you really trust social science scientists to have those insights? Do you really think that that that, that they can provide those kind of insights at the current time? Um well maybe somewhat better than the uh than the lay person. Okay. But I think if we're going to talk a bit about AI, um uh, I'm not one of those people who believes that uh, a super intelligence would take over the world. Yeah, um, but, I, I, but I worry about two things. First, the um, fact that clearly already, um, not AI, but uh, uh, automation mm -hmm. and uh, similar things is changing very much work patterns, uh, and this this can be benign if the resources are redeployed. To take an example, um, if those who work in Amazon warehouses and in uh, telephone call centers can be replaced by machines, which is mm. quite feasible, yeah. um, then uh, uh, that's a plus plus, provided that jobs can be found for those displaced. Mm, yeah, and absolutely. the kind of jobs that are needed where you need to be a human being, not a machine, and where currently there are far too few people who are um, underappreciated and underpaid, is in being carers for young and old and teachers' assistants, mm -hmm. custodians in public parks and things like that. So if the um, uh, uh, mega companies that make money from uh, AI and, and, uh, and all that um, are properly taxed, and that's of course hard because they're multinational. Yeah. But if, if that can be done, and if those resources can be hypothecated for workers in socially valuable um, uh, enterprises like the caring profession, etc., that's a plus plus. So um, that, that's an example where uh, one can actually uh, develop these things. So my view is that we can benefit from uh, AI by using it. Um, to supplement human expertise in things like radiology, etc., um, and to replace um, humans in the mind-numbing jobs like uh, um, working in a warehouse. Oh, so we do that. Um, but, but but I think we we've got to be careful because um, uh, uh, I think as uh, Rodney Brooks, the inventor of the Baxter robot, said, he yeah. he's not he's not worried about uh, AI taking over. But he thinks for a long time we'll have to worry more about humans, uh, about uh, human stupidity than artificial uh, intelligence. Yeah. Artificial intelligence. Yeah. And I yeah, think, I think... Is, but we we'll also we we'll also I think have to worry about um, uh, just malfunctions and bugs because the the uh, the worry is that people are uh, using AI to replace human judgment uh, in. Um, uh, medical diagnosis, mm -hmm. deciding whether you deserve mm -hmm. parole if you're in prison, and things of that kind. And uh, this may be um, appropriate in some senses. You can perhaps show that, on average, the AI, AI makes better decisions than a human does. But there's always a worry that there's some bugs in the uh, system which we don't know about. And so one should keep a human in in the system. And so what what is worrying is if uh, uh, a machine has uh, bugs uh, which aren't 
uh, weeded out soon enough and, uh, and therefore cause social damage. Um, or uh, if there's a breakdown, which is very hard to repair. I mean, mm -hmm. suppose that there was some, um, uh, some breakdown which um, affected the, uh, the internet globally or something like mm -hmm. that. Think what, how much worse would it have been if the internet had failed during the COVID Pandemic. lockdown. Uh, so I think to be over-dependent on interlinked technology on a global scale is very risky. And so those are the sorts of downsides I worry about, not the machine um, becoming Take, not, the, not, not, yeah, not, not uh, Terminator. Yeah, no, and of course, I, we did jump ahead. I do want to go back, but I, but, I, but, you know, but I couldn't resist that question of whether social scientists really can help I, us. I think I, I'm, not, it's, I'm, I'm more dubious. But, but when it comes to this question of, um, I, I don't want to leave it, this, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the point is that, and I think those, this goes back to maybe even one of your old, John Maynard Keynes, who I you know, um, who, who argued that in principle, capitalism or at least industrialization would be wonderful because it would take all these boring jobs, factory jobs, you know, these, and, and people would have more free time to, mm -hmm. you know, and to have leisure and do, and listen to music. And so, and, and, and it would, and so in principle, it'd be a wonderful thing. And of course it hasn't necessarily been directed that way but i i think i would amplify what you're saying and i think i, I maybe it was um, jeffrey sachs who i first heard say this in a way not necessarily just taking mind-numbing jobs and put and moving them into 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 uh other jobs that are maybe more beneficial useful but no jobs at all that if 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 we can produce more resources with fewer people and we, if if everyone benefits from that, we'll all be able to spend time at coffee shops and listen to music, and we may just have lives where we can where we can also just enjoy cultural things without necessarily um, work. That namely, the, take the, the 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 goal that Keynes talked about, which is to more more or less have technology make the average human's life more pleasant. Yeah. Yes, but of course, uh, um, uh, a crucial uh, limitation on freedom comes from lack of money. Yeah. And, you've got, and, uh, and that's the big problem now. Uh, yeah. that, uh, well, that's, I mean, I think what Sachs is saying. Are you, 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 not getting enough money to enjoy the kind of life you mentioned. Well, I think the choice, the, uh, I think we agree maybe on the danger and the, and the, and the necessity. And I, 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 I'm probably pretty pessimistic, but. AI and, you know, we've already seen high technology has produced vast wealth. And the question is, with that vast wealth, and, and AI will be another example of that, those companies that control AI will have vaster wealth. Will that be progressively funneled into f fewer and fewer individuals, become thereby more rich and more powerful? Or will that vast wealth could just make the world better for everyone? And I think the example thus far is that the former is more likely than the latter. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think uh, uh, this this leads to general politics, and uh, yeah. we were uh, uh, I, I, being in Britain. Um, we've got a deplorable government at the moment, mm -hmm. and one of the most deplorable features of it is it uh, wants to learn more from the United States than from Scandinavia. <laughs> and my view is that we ought to learn more from Scandinavia, which accepts high taxation in return for greater equality and a better welfare system. And so, as you say, uh, it's possible to have this, but uh, um, it requires political attitudes rather different from those which prevail uh, in your country um, and indeed um, in, 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 uh, country, in the UK yeah. at the moment, although I hope not for much longer. Well, I could say the same thing. Actually, by the way, I'm in, in Canada now. So it, oh, Canada. But, but yeah, so, so it's maybe a little, a little less extreme then, but I, but I have, yeah, I know what you're saying. Okay, look, I wanted to hit those things. Well, I want to go back. We will talk about AI because, I, again, uh, at, at, at some point as well. But I wanted to go back. I, I don't want to leave. There's several important issues you talk about. Once again, climate change sort of and, and then biomedicine and then AI. So going back, we've we talked about some general aspects of climate change. But something you point out, which is an issue that really isn't discussed so much, is population growth and biodiversity loss. Um, mm -hmm. One one rarely sees, maybe because it's politically incorrect, to see population growth tied in uh, into the problems associated with climate change 
uh, and energy as uh, you don't you don't hear them discussed you certainly didn't hear them discussed by your one of your heroes pope francis for whom is not who's not one of my heroes mm -hmm. but um who as, as we talked about in the last thing in one hand gave a wonderful encyclical about climate change but at the same time refused to discuss the possibility or in, in, encourage family planning in Africa, um, which is an essential part of that. And so it seemed to me to be hollow. But but popula population growth is an, I an issue, and it's, it's, it's an issue not just for the drain on the world, on what, what a, a world with 10 billion people will be, but as you also point out, a drain on biodiversity. So, so I wanted to talk about that a little bit, since you talk about those in your book, and ask you to comment on on this issue of should of of is there's this divergent attitude a very divergent impact in the global north population growth is decreasing the rate of population growth is decreasing and it's also becoming negative in certain places in the in the global north and the global south it's increasing so what do we do um well uh it's not just we in the north. I think it's very important that uh, uh, it's a matter for the countries themselves. Yeah. I mean, what we don't, what clearly is unacceptable um, is um, uh, people in, in the north um, uh, um, imposing their work. Making statements about what should be done in these other nations. But I think um, uh, it, it's clear that m many nations which are impoverished, as uh, they are in, uh, Parts of India and rural uh, parts of of Africa, um, they would be able to develop more quickly if the population stabilized. And of course, the question is, will it stabilize? Um, we know that urbanization, women's mm -hmm. education, and things like that make the population stabilize. Um, and um, uh, it, that may happen in, in Africa. It may not, because of course it could be that even when people have the choice, they want to have big families. But then, of course, that that will lead to um, a huge uh, conurbation in West Africa, mm -hmm. about 100 million people, um, mm -hmm. several hundred million people, etc. And, um, and, and Nigeria having a population equal to that of Europe and North America combined. And that's yeah. and, um, uh, the question is, is that a good thing for, for Africa? And uh, um, if if the view in Africa is they don't want that, then let's hope that uh, they they can stabilize the population. And uh, I think that, as, a, uh, as you know, there's some UN projections say that um, uh, although there'll be a continuing rise, partly because of the lifespan extended uh, by medical techniques uh, still in the middle of a century uh, by 2080 the world population may peak and uh, that that's maybe a good thing and of course let's bear in mind that um uh, the doom mongers like uh, paul ehrlich 50 yeah. years ago the club of rome and limits to yeah, growth yes. which i read as a kid and really impacted yes. me well of course the population was uh, 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 less than half then what it is now and they predicted um, doom and massive starvation um, in the 70s and 80s, which didn't come about. Uh, so, uh, of course, you, using um, sustainably intensive agriculture, it's quite possible for this popula a population to be fed. So it's not a, necessarily a disaster uh, if the population rises. Um, and also, um, as regards biodiversity, I think um, uh, we all do depend on the natural capital don't want to deplete that. And uh, there's an ethical issue here. And I quote uh, yeah. the ecologist E.O. Wilson, who says mm. that if uh, um, this generation's actions lead to mass extinctions, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for, because it's an irreversible destruction of the, uh, the beauty of nature, as it were. And here, uh, I think we can all agree with the Pope. And, uh, uh, and that therefore means that uh, we want to ensure that the, the food is provided in a sustainable intensive way, which may mean that we should encourage um, uh, artificial meat and things of that kind. Well, but okay. We, sh we shouldn't be sensational about the problems of rising population at all. I'm well, not saying so. And of course, it's not for the global north to to uh, pronounce on these things anyway. Well, it's about maybe for the research in the global north to talk about the implications will be. Yes, that's to right. Study, to study, do research on what the implications will be, which yes, will provide yes. the necessary 
um, uh, perspective that, in principle, people could then use to make decisions yeah, on their own. Yeah, so uh, yeah. along the lines of that. Uh, yes, but so, the, so, so that's what we... In Africa, which can join in that research. Yeah, exactly. And your point, and we'll get to it, is that we want to encourage Centers for Excellence in Africa and other other places. That, that'll be four or five hours down the road here when we get to that point in our conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but... but but you do say, let me let me say that you know maybe maybe you're saying this is going to be out of date too. You say there's a well-known estimate from the World Wildlife Fund for Nature that the world is already despoiling the planet by consuming natural resources at about 1.7 times the quote sustainable level. So, mm. so that's a statement that we already are past sustainability. Do you think that technology will just, I mean, like like has happened at the Club of Rome or or limits to growth or whatever that that may be true now, but technology will allow us. To have a sustainable level um, yes. at the at ten billion people. I just thought I just thought so. Yes, because uh, uh, that World Wildlife Fund um, estimate is based on knowledge of the rate at which they're cutting down the Amazon forest and all that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, but but are there, as you quote Swedish environmentalist Johan Rockström, is are you, there are there are undoubtedly it's some maybe there are no planetary boundaries. Maybe it's always a moving. A moving target. Maybe what seems like a planetary boundary now won't be in twenty or thirty years because of technology, and no, no, no. and 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 there won't. And it will. Do you have optimism in that sense that that there are no at some level there are no irreversible um, that that technology will keep pushing those boundaries out as long as we need them to. I think it could, but still, when I ask the question, um, uh, ideally, what should the world population be? Mm -hmm. I mean, if everyone is to have a, a beachfront property, then the world population has to be cut to 1% of its present yeah, size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's obviously extreme. But uh, the, the question is, uh, what is the population we'd like the world to have? And uh, uh, I would have thought most people would say probably not much more than 10 billion. Well, I'd say it now because it's that's what's going to happen. Yeah, think, yeah. If you ask people, maybe... Fifty years ago, they might have said much, not much more than four billion or three billion. Well, that's right. That's right. When there's ten billion, the question is: Will people say, "Well, not really much more than fifteen billion"? Um, well, well, they might, but I'm saying that they, they might uh, realize that um, uh, the quality of life would be greater with a lower population density. Well, but it, but it, but the question I, I guess I have is: Isn't it obvious that the population of life in the world would already be better if we had less than eight billion people? Um. I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, interesting. Um, well, I hope in your pontifical when you when you go down to the Vatican that maybe you can t talk to, to since you do indirectly at least talk to the Pope. You might talk a little bit about population in the global South and maybe help uh, at least that conversation move forward in mm -hmm. one of the as you say in one of the people who probably has a greater following in the global South than anyone else might have. Um, but anyway, uh, one of the things you talk about is natural capital, mm -hmm. which comes to my question of the, when I when I talk about social sciences or sometimes despairingly, the science the quote the science I'm most disparaging of is economics, and um, and I, you make the point that we don't you know you, we don't calculate necessarily or at least traditionally economics hasn't calculated the calculate they calculate capital but not natural cal capital it doesn't feature in national budgets for example as you say a forest is cut down it, it, whenever it's cut down instead of seeing as the economic benefits that come from the sale of the products and stuff which it, it should be recorded as a negative contribution to a national stop stock of natural capital it's been urged by your, your colleague your colleague partha Dasgupta at, at, at cambridge but currently in most countries it did not happen isn't is this an example of of really the failure of economics of us to i mean economics has led us astray in this regard that that we if if we continually think of capital in terms of monetary resources alone then then we miss when it comes to reaching the it, it didn't matter when we weren't at the global limits when we could move on when we despoiled an environment you could move on to the next one or we didn't care if you despoiled the environment of some poor country because you were England and you had a big comp, big empire and you could move on. Um, mm -hmm. yes. But does this, doesn't it mean really that economics has failed us in that regard? Well, I think it's uh, only in recent decades that people have taken this seriously. I mean, 
mm-hmm. their 1951 paper, Ehrlich and Holdren did address this sort of issue. Yeah. And you mentioned my um, my colleague and old friend, Parthas Gupta, yeah, yeah. Um, wrote, wrote a 500-page report, which was input to the uh, Montreal conference, which took place uh, in early December this year. And uh, this is, I think, leading people to realize that um, uh, natural capital is something which is under threat uh, with the greater pressure from larger numbers of people, but more demanding uh, uh, populations. And so so I think it's being taken on board. And I think uh, um, uh, we shouldn't be too despairing of economists. <laughs> I'm, okay, good. Yes, you're always more generous in this regard than me. It's, it's um, a very hard subject. Yeah, it, it's a yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a hard subject. I, I agree. It's it's very hard subject, and therefore hard to know. Hard subjects. Uh, it's hard to know when to trust the results from hard subjects. I guess that's the point. I would say, and I'll leave it at that. And it's, when it's hard, that's why you and I are, do the simple stuff. We do the astronomy and the cosmology is so much easier. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, the, 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 I guess the, 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 the to leave this area, you, t- you talk about the IPCC as a very important group. Um, and, and I think you, you, you say there are three major findings ultimately that we should, that are sort of uncontestable. One, humans are unequivocally responsible for global warming. Some climate-induced changes, such as continued sea level rise, are irreversible, at least for centuries. And it's very late, but here's where you're more optimistic than some. You're very late, but thankfully not too late to avoid the worst impacts of climate breakdown. And um, when it comes to um, this, the key questions you raise, which are interesting, I don't know whether metaphysical questions, certainly philosophical ones in some sense, is risk, this wonderful statement of risk, risk assessment is different than risk management and they're very different and Mm -hmm. we can make and we and we can do the kind of calculations that insurance companies do which is to multiply probability of risk by the nature of its impact Mm -hmm. and and decide then whether to act or not yes but and we don't even do that yet in globally and probably we should especially given the uncertainty certainty of certain tipping points such as the global impact of potentially the ice sheet in in Greenland melting and raising sea levels by 21 feet, which would which would change the world, it, it make the world completely different than it, it is now. Um, that that may have a small probability, but a large impact, and we maybe should consider that as a an uncertainty, which instead of causing us to in lead us to inaction because it's uncertain, should leave us to action because we want to we want to. Um, and there's another good phrase somewhere to get in your book somewhere about. We want to we want to think not just in time but just in case. That's the that's the phrase used. Mm-hmm. Um, but you talk about weighing long term because climate change is a long term issue, yes. and you and it's weighing future generations versus the present, and mm-hmm. that's an interesting conundrum. And I and you rate you discuss it, and I thought maybe I'd ask you to elaborate on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Well, of course, um, uh, cl- climate change is something which is getting more serious. Um, but uh, the very serious issues like the melting of all green ice, um, that wouldn't happen on less than a few centuries. And so the question is, to what extent in our calculus of, uh, of risks, uh, we should uh, uh, discount the far future. And um, of course, most politicians are happy to discount the future. <laughs> Completely. Beyond, the beyond four election. years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, and, and I think, uh, as we said earlier, Um, We need to uh, persuade the public and politicians that they should think about what will happen in the lives of their children and grandchildren who will be alive at the end of a century. And so we ought to uh, uh, worry about that. And, of course, that is the reason why it's very sensible to have the target of uh, keeping the uh, mean global temperature rise below 2 degrees. Well, 1.5 ideally, but certainly Mm. 2. because that will give us uh, less chance of encountering some tipping point that would make the changes irreversible. Um, and um, as it were, buy time for clever ideas um, to make it easier for us to depend on carbon-free energy generation. So uh, I, I think that's 
that's very sensible that we should um, we should value um, the the long term to that that extent. But but um, but it did cause me to think about this. The point is that when the other aspect is the longer term out you go, the more uncertain you are about what's going to happen. Right. And so therefore, <laughs> it's harder to weigh them the same amount because you don't know all of the variables. For example, you could have wait, looked long term for 40 years ago about food production and made a decision that people would be starving today at a level they're not because you didn't know about the technology, the green revolution. Yeah, yes. Um, no, but that's precisely the case. And so you, you've got to ensure that um, uh, we uh, make realistic predictions. And I think, um, uh, whereas some of the other predictions in my book about the chance of some uh, um, bioweapon lead to a pandemic and things like yeah. that, those are very hard to estimate. Um, and uh, the, the chance of getting larger year by year, nonetheless. But I think in the case of climate change, um, we do know enough to know that we are heading for a temperature rise of, of say, three degrees this century. At least, maybe four. A mean temperature rise, uh, and that could, could be dangerous for many parts of the world. And uh, that, that's not an improbable scenario. That's the likely scenario. Most likely. Well, yeah, the most... Know, uh, mm. If we don't change course. And so, if we, but, uh, but I think um, when we... Uh, talk about uh, several centuries into the future, I fully agree with you that we don't know enough to uh, make predictions, and therefore it's not reasonable to make great sacrifices now uh, for people several centuries in the future, which we have no idea what their preferences and tastes are, and especially because, as I discuss later in the book, um, human beings themselves may have changed in, 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 in the next few centuries in the ways they haven't over the last 50,000 years. Yeah. And so for all these reasons, we don't know uh, what the uh, preferences and tastes will be that far ahead. And so I, I would say that to um, plan for eventualities which are plausible within the lifetime of some people already living, which means by the end of the century, is prudent and would have public support. But beyond that, I completely agree that we have to be cautious in how much we um, uh, weight the arguments in favor of the far distant future. Yeah, yeah, and it, that's right. Although, of course, one there always there's always a wrench in the works, and there are people who say that even at one point five degrees, you have irreversible tipping points. But but yeah, yeah. as you say, as you say, we don't. Well, okay, so we have a few centuries so to, to deal with. We, we have a few centuries to deal. With. And there's mediation, there's adaptation, there's, you know, and and so it is true that, you know, even if Greenland ice melting is inevitable, we have three or four centuries at least to deal with the worst parts of that. And that's a lot that can be, a lot can be done in a way, you know, humanity can respond in principle. And there is, uh, we, both you and I have great optimism in science and technology. Yes, it's yes. not so much optimism in, in politics. But yes. to, to leave that, I think I'll leave that, if, but I will leave, read a, a quote from you, which I want to, which we've already said, and I, it's where you use this wonderful sentence, but it's still crucial, however, to keep clear water between the science on the one hand and the policy response on the other. Risk assessment should be separate than risk, from risk management. Mm -hmm. And I think you, what you don't say, but it's implicit, is risk assessment is in some sense the province of scientists and researchers. Risk management is the province of the public and politicians. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important. We'll come back to that over and over again. But, it, you know, but it's but you and I would argue it's the role of scientists to at least provide that that um, that input of risk assessment, because without that, you can't make risk management as use is silly. And mm -hmm. it comes cool. back to a debate you and I had earlier where, where really I think we're on the same side here. But, you know, this question of whether you can get off from is. I, I, which we both agree you can't, I think. But right. but my point was that without is, you really can't get ought, it seems to me. Yep, exactly. And I think that's that's really the... Science gives us the is, and, and the rest is 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 the ought. And, 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 but without gives, it... Gives the, the maybe anyway, if not... Yeah, the, the maybe. Is. But without it, you, then then the ought is just unrealistic. And, and that was part... I guess that's part of my problem with religion. But anyway, we won't get there right now. Um... Uh, but I, w I do want to go to bio one or two things you written. you make a point that 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 um, that people are 
uh, the, actually one of the areas where England and 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 certainly Europe is unfortunately gone in the wrong direction compared to the United States states is is uh, genetic modification of foods and things like that where 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 really uh, decisions are made political decisions were made that really don't make sense from a scientific perspective. You agree? Um, when it comes to ge ge genetic mod GMOs, the fact that... Yes, the, yes, yeah. yes. Um, well, I mean, I, I would agree that uh, probably uh, Europe has been too cautious. Um, okay. But of course, uh, 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 what's happening now is that the uh, limited kind of genetic modification involving CRISPR where it doesn't involve uh, trans species uh, mm -hmm. uh, changes um, is less risky. And um, uh, certainly one of the only things which is a benefit of Brexit for the UK is that we are now legalizing that kind of genetic um, uh, modification where it's, um, it's not anything trans species. And, um, uh, and I think that's that's probably reasonable. I think we're right to be cautious about uh, trans species. Yeah, it's it's um, well, as you point out, the gulf between what medical science may enable us to do and what is prudent or ethically actually able to do will shift and widen in many cases in in ways that'll be difficult to cope with. As because biotechnology really is the area of greatest and most rapid growth in terms of science right now. Yes. And 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 that and and you point out something interesting to me that I hadn't really hit is that people are much more hesitant to deal with genetic sort of modifications that address problems than they are. Uh, they're much more hesitant to deal with genetic modifications that suggest enhancements than they are to deal with genetic modifications that address problems. Yes. And and I th could you discuss that a little bit because that's an important point I think. Well, I think it's true, isn't it, that uh, uh, the obvious case when there's just one gene that gives you Huntington's disease or something like that, then if if by CRISPR you can eliminate that gene, I think everyone would say that was a good thing. Um, but um, uh, human enhancement, making people better looking or more intelligent, um, everyone knows that uh, that would involve understanding the interaction of many thousand genes. And so you couldn't even start until you'd had... Uh, an AI to analyze millions of genomes to find out which was the optimum combination. And then you've got to have the ability to synthesize the genome with that optimum com combination. And even then, you won't know if you haven't introduced a lot of uh, small negative effects that will outweigh the benefit. And so uh, the idea of um, human enhancement in a serious way uh, does look very, very far in the future. Uh, and then, of course, um, if it were realistic, then you have to ask, would it be uh, something which we should encourage? And uh, one, I would say, if it's something that everyone could have, that's great. But uh, if it's going to lead to some sort of elite, um, then um, I think uh, one would be slightly worried about it. And, of course, this has come up in a sort of semi-serious way now with these three labs, two in California and one mm -hmm. here in Cambridge, called Altos Labs, uh, bankrolled by billionaires, uh, which are going to focus on uh, aging. Yes. Aging and extending the healthy lifespan. And uh, most people are rather pessimistic about uh, the prospects of any drastic success. Um, but of course, if there were to be a drastic success and there could be some uh, uh, small elite that could uh, live twice as long as the rest of us, then we'd have to ask, is that something which we want to happen? I don't know, but uh, um, certainly there are, there are these labs, and um, the way I put it in my book is that um, uh, uh, these these um, billionaires, when they were young, they wanted to be rich. Now they're rich, they want they to be young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not quite so easy. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, should we encourage them? I don't think we should. Well, I I have no. Well, it's their money, but um, and at some level, you know, I it, it, yeah, I mean, I don't mind them wasting their money, primarily because. Uh, something you say somewhere in the book or i i think you say it you do we when we even we we both disparaging about human space exploration but the one thing that often happens is when you throw money at technology that you often find useful things 
on the yes. side. And so maybe there'll be something useful that'll come of this yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. aging anti -age. that may be useful for everyone, the unexpected yeah. results. So whenever yes. they spend a lot of money, I have less worries about billionaires spending money on new technologies because often this it results in something that might actually be useful for others. No, I agree because they can't target their work. It's rather like cancer research in the yeah. 1970s where I didn't know what to do directly, um, but they indirectly understood cell biology much better. And uh, this will understand, uh, lead to understand the um, the way in which the um, chromosomes change as they age and all that. So it's a good thing. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Uh, to get back to that in intelligence thing, I would argue it's even that you, you presented all of the concerns and issues that make it both logistically difficult to imagine and also uh, ethically. Uh, questionable. You talked about the basically the the disparity of access to whatever enhancement resources are available. I would argue that in the common world, that in the current world, it's even another thing. As you'd have people arguing about what intelligence is and whether it's really fair to to argue that more intelligent really has any absolute meaning, because no, so yeah, people, well, I, I, yeah. Yeah. No, there will be that sort of thing. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So it'd be a lot of that because you'd see that right now. You'd say, "Well, people have a right to be emotionally intelligent and not, in, you know, whatever." So yeah. you you'd have that huge social issue. But but I but the other aspect of biomedicine that is a worry you point out is sort of is is sort of uh, is is the bioterrorist aspect. Now, mm. I both you and I have been involved in the in the at various levels at times in the Bolton and the Atomic Scientists. And as you know, I was, I was chair of the board of sponsors for a long time, interacting with you as one of the mm -hmm. sponsor members. Um, and um, I used to be more worried about bioterrorism. And we had several meetings with biological experts who argued to us a few, to be not as concerned globally as much as locally. I mean, that you could create local disasters, but that the robustness of life would be very difficult to create a new virus you know, the body's had 4 billion years of, 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 of opportunities to, to fight viruses. And so it, it, would be dif it would be difficult to, from scratch, to create a totally new virus that would be able to totally defeat the body's defense mechanisms globally. Uh, um, and, um, and that it isn't, as, it isn't as, while it is true that you can get, that hacking is now a, a, a tool for almost anyone who wants to, in their garage or MIT undergraduates, that actually to really do sophisticated genetic manipulations is still a ra rather difficult art and 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 requires a great deal of scientific infrastructure and therefore it isn't as much of a worry as some people would suggest. What do you think about that? Well, I agree that it needs sophisticated expertise um, and. Uh, it may be done in in some uh, uh, lab which specializes. Mm -hmm. There are sixty labs around the world which are sort of grade four security, yeah, yeah. and uh, and it's not clear how good the security is in in all of those. Um, but of course, it has been possible for the last ten years to make the um, influenza virus more virulent or more transmissible by so yeah. kind of it can, the same can be done for the coronavirus now, um, and. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's by no means um, implausible that uh, viruses like um, the Zika virus or others mm. could be made more virulent, more transmissible, or have a long latency period, or any of the things that make them more dangerous to the world um, uh, by the application of, um, of, of techniques. And, uh, and, and this is such a possible... Uh, a catastrophic threat potentially that uh, one has to be very very concerned about the security in the labs that do this sort of thing and you um, you made a bet to that you in fact in 2003 way in advance of the of a pandemic you made this bet yes. um that that and you quote bioterror or bio error yes. will lead to one million casualties in a single event within a six month period starting no later than december 31st 2020 and the interesting yes. point is I actually think you probably won the bet based on what I know, but but we don't know that it's quite possible that coronavirus was a bio error due to these gain of function activities and other. In Wuhan, yes. Well, of course, uh, uh, um, Stephen Pinker took me up on this bet, and yeah, we yeah. both 
he wrote an article which I summarised in my book, um, yeah. saying that we weren't going to settle the, the bet uh, for the reason you mentioned, that uh, um, uh, I, I said that uh, um, uh, I would win if the pandemic was caused by bio-error or bio-terror. Yeah. And uh, if it was a lab leakage, I would win. But, uh, of course, as you know, the um, balance of opinion is that it wasn't a leakage, but it could have been. It's not a crazy hypothesis. Um, and uh, um, and so, in fact, Stephen and I wrote an article in New Statesman um, nearly 18 months ago saying we weren't going to settle the bet because of that uncertainty. And we went on to say that if it turned out that it had been a leakage from the lab, lab then it's better if we never know definitely, because then the uh, tragedy would have a villain. And, oh. if, uh, uh, and, and if it could be blamed on the Chinese, that would aggravate the already disastrously bad relationship between China and some Western countries. And so it would be better if we never knew. Wow, know, that's we, interesting for you for, to hear. A scientist say it's better that we... Never know. That's in, I understand politically. So it's true as a political issue, it's important. But one would also argue, and I think Matt Ridley did in in the book he wrote on this subject, and I talked about it, that yes. the benefit of knowing is so we don't repeat it. And the question is, which is which is which is better to know what went wrong and therefore not repeat it, or to not know so we don't exacerbate fools who like to foment um, hatred. Well, I mean. Uh, uh... I, I don't see that argument at all because there's oh, no reason why we, should, we shouldn't tighten up security. And uh, as I say, I, I worry very much about there being 60 labs where they yeah. could do this sort of thing, uh, which are supposed to be great for security. And uh, I think it's very, very important to uh, um, ramp up the security. And I also think that uh, we are going to have to have fairly intrusive surveillance of people with this expertise because one person um, doing this sort of thing is too many. And so yeah. I think whether or not um, Wuhan was uh, caused by some mm -hmm. leakage rather than being, being natural, um, it's a wake-up call. That this it's sort of a wake-up call. Yeah, mm. yeah I'd, I'd, it'd be neat to know which kind of techniques are most dangerous. I mean, I'd like to know that. Uh, that's yeah. why I guess I'd like to know which, because there could be some techniques which may appear to be dangerous but not and are easily controlled that may be beneficial once again this question of what's beneficial again, and what isn't that's right. and so yeah. that's why i guess i fall in the favor of knowing and hoping we can deal with the hatred and 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 uh, yes. ideologues well, and, I, I, don't see, mm -hmm. I don't think it make any difference to what we ought to be doing yeah uh, okay. never happened in rohan okay I, whether we can target but anyway that's a that's a that's a question that's a detailed question um, given limited resources, I, you know whether what we should target is an interesting question. But you're absolutely right. I, it it we we need to be more prudent, and this has been a wake up call in that regard. Mm -hmm. Speaking of wake calls, the last thing is this question of a demented loner that you point out. One, I don't know if you're as uh, into movies as I am. I don't think I've ever talked to you about movies, but uh, but but um, you know I kind of really am into popular culture and movies, and mm -hmm. I, I, I they influence me a lot. So do you know, did you ever see the movie 12 Monkeys by actually no. Terry Gilliam, who's a, you know, who's a, who's, a, you know, you anyway. And, um, uh, but there are a number, but this, it's not new at all. There, there, there are, it's a common theme in science fiction. And it was in also in, in the Kingsman, I think. And then even in the most recent James Bond movie, which you may or may not have seen. Do you ever see any James Bond movies? Yes. Oh, good. I think the recent one was an example. But where, where this is a theme of some people saying, look, we need to get rid of a fair fraction of the world's population. And the 12 monkeys was exactly that was a bioterror that actually got out of control. But it was around someone's idea that, hey, we, we should just introduce a new virus that will solve the problem for us. No, I think it's true because I think um, uh, this wouldn't be done by a, a terrorist group with limited aims. Uh, nor by a, a governments in warfare, which you don't know the consequence, but it would be some crazy person who thinks there are too many people in the world and uh, doesn't care who they kill. Yeah, and you, so you, you are worried about that? You think that's... Uh... Uh, yeah, well, well, I mean, I, I think uh, it's something that's improbable, but the uh, it could be so catastrophic, um, uh, especially if the techniques of uh, um, gain of function become more widely disseminated or more efficient, uh, that uh, um, it's certainly my number one worry of all these things. 
Okay, I get interesting. Again, one comes back to this question, and I'm not a biologist, but I come back to this question of even if a gain of function thing, it would cause a disaster. It was, there's no doubt it would cause a, a, and global economic issues. But yes. it's hard to imagine anything that really is going to efficiently wipe out a fair fraction of the world's population that could be done um, just because of the way, you know, even the pandemic, you know, because things evolve to be, become less generally less virulent, even if they are more initially. And, and also, yeah, anyway, it's, it, it, you can imagine disasters that are global or that are national or even international. But, um, but I guess I'm, I'm less worried about, frac I'm more worried about creating a global catastrophe in terms of its, its national, international geopolitical repercussions and economic repercussions than I am maybe of getting rid of a third of the world's population or something like that. Well, uh, I think you ought to worry with more because... Uh, okay, good. Um, uh, anytime I learned, I'm supposed to worry more, it's better. <laughs> COVID-19 had a fatality rate of less than 1%. Yeah. Um, uh, there are um, uh, other viruses that have a fatality rate of 70%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if one could modify one of those to be as transmissible as COVID-19, it will be a mega global disaster. Oh yeah, it would. It, I agree. I guess, I, I, I guess the question is, is that, it, that it's a big if, and the question is, are, are, it, it, can you do that? And Well, but, I mean, it, uh, even releasing a, a natural one, we know, we know yeah, the Zika yeah. virus or Ebola, Ebola virus, um, but Ebola isn't yeah. transmissible except by, yeah. by touch. Um, but if you could, um, uh, e even without tinkering with these things, a release uh, could be oh, then you produce a disaster, but it's always local. The big problem is also disseminating it globally. No, no, no. Well, 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 You'd have to should... have a much longer latency period, as you point out. You'd have to design it to. Well, no, but we. Uh, why? Why shouldn't what happened with COVID, COVID happen to this other one? And so, if well, it's, it's, it'd be, it's already. It'd be, I mean, there's been. I guess because it's so uh, well, it, it could look. Let's. I'm not one to say it can't. I guess the the point I'm saying is that Zika and Ebola, there have been leaks of that, and generally because they're not so transmissible, they they've been controlled. And, right. yes, yes. and, and so, 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 yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I guess but, I view it as a danger, but not a global danger yet. But you, but if one could, yeah. Yes. Anyway, it is something. Once again, it's best to think of the. I just watched a movie where it said someone said that it's best to think of the worst uh, in advance because uh, because someone should be thinking of the worst in advance in any case yes. because if you don't um, then 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 uh, then then you might be. Surprised. I would say it's not that implausible, and uh, the probability is going up year by year um, yeah. because the techniques are becoming more uh, understood and uh, and more widely disseminated. Now here here's Martin. I I actually. I do want to. I wanted to go a little bit um, uh, more in, into. Um, um, uh, it, it, well, I want to. Uh, we're almost at the end of the first part of your book, okay? And what I'm going to suggest to you, if it's okay, I, I, I'm enjoying the discussion. I think people will enjoy it a lot. <laughs> I, I, I think what I'd, I'd like to for maybe I'd like to go over AI. Just one more question, and then if we could, could we can then take a break and then at another day continue this. For the second half of your book, would you be willing to do that? Uh, yes, or I mean, easier for me would be to take a to take a break for just half an hour and then continue. Can, can uh, you do that? I, I, I can do it. I just didn't no, want to tire no. you out. If you're willing to do it, no. It's just that this week is particularly sort of free of other because it's a, it's the holiday week. I agree. Yeah, um, yes. Because I, I think we I will. There's enough substantive issues. I think to go for at least another yeah. hour. And and if in my yes, opinion. Yes, yes. No, okay. that's, that's fine by me. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a non-profit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.